Welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming. We're uh, getting, getting close to the end here. We've got all kinds of fun stuff coming up. The field trip this week, which means that you won't have your lab on Thursday or Friday, uh, but you'll be meeting at the bus for your field trip on Sunday, and then uh, continuing out to Stone Valley and Shavers Creek. And then, uh, and then coming back on the bus. So I'll be sending details about uh, the bus pickup and location, and, um, and then you'll have that. The information from your TA about your departure time is there for you. They have that. So we're all set there. Okay, there's a lot. Is there some, do you all have a question right here? What's that? Yeah. Oh, you figured it out. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, so we'll get started with today, knowing that this is going to be an exciting week. Uh, we're in this um, place of trying to figure out what we're going to do about all the things that we learned, right? So Kiss the Ground is final extra credit movie happening on Wednesday, April 12th. You'll meet Maddie there as usual, and there will be discussion afterward. Uh, so that's coming up for you. You sent that out in a Canvas announcement. And you can continue to sign up for TA Conversations if you feel so inclined. In order to do that now, you just send me an email and we get you connected that way. Um, and so I'm searching for you know, the TAs that are here in this room. I love that it's a beautiful representation of diversity in so many different ways. Majors and ideas and perspectives and life experience. And so I know that some of you may be feeling some self-doubt about, well, I'm only only a first year student, or I, I don't know how to lead like my TA did, or what's the value for me of being a TA? Um, so come and have a conversation. Ask those questions um, and know that there are, uh, that we do this training semester, so you don't need to jump right in. You don't need to know how to do it. The training course continues this adventure that we've started here in this class, learning more about yourself and digging deeper as well as creating a community among the TAs and applying all of that experience um, so that we can teach as if life matters. That's the theme of the training course. So where we've been then thinking about our ecological footprint, where we are continuing, we're, we're in this time of cultural shift, cultural shift in a story, whether you feel it or not. It's happening, there is a shift. So what is it that you can imagine for yourself? The journal assignment this week is about that, creating a new story. How are you gonna find your, your path in this way that's inspiring to you? So we haven't done it in a little while, but take a moment and put your feet flat on the floor and close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so and take some long deep breaths in and let it go out slow. And as you feel that long breath in, you might be able to feel your ribs expand. As your lungs take in the air, you know, the ribs are, are part of, they have to be flexible to let us do this, to take air in and out. The space between the ribs expands. So notice it, soften your gaze, really. Take in what's happening in your chest. So this flexibility in our spines, right? Flexibility helps us to survive. Our body flexibility. We are made flexible so that we can endure impact, so that we can move very quickly in, in creative and interesting ways when we need to or when we want to. This flexibility is really important. So how, like our bodies, how are your minds and your hearts feeling about flexibility? How flexible are you when it comes to change? 
take a moment to reflect on this. You know, what happens if somebody says, actually, there's a change of plans and we're going to do this other thing instead? Or what happens when you're presented with a new opportunity that you didn't know was going to come your way? How does that change affect you? And how do you act and or react to that change, that opportunity? Talk to your neighbor when you, when you feel ready to do so. chatting. So the change, I asked this question about flexibility because what we're talking about is potentially, you know, making change for yourself in relation to the choices, right? So how could we lower our ecological footprint significantly and work less, have more fun, be more free and creative, and become more fully ourselves? It might, you know, you might be in a space where that's already happening for you, or it might be happening in some areas of your life, but not others. Or maybe there's a place that you feel a change coming um, related to what we've talked about, or something totally different. There's so much going on in your lives right now. It's really cool, and it can be really overwhelming. So thinking about this change and how flexible we can be in our head, our heart, and our gut, as well as in our bodies. So this change is an opportunity, right? And I, I like that about life, that it's always presenting opportunity, right? The things that are surprising opportunities that come my way, um, sometimes they're really hard things, hard choices to make. And yet, um, I don't want to miss out, right? There's a revolution. There's a cultural shift happening. And I'm going to jump on that, right? Because it feels important. So today's topic is transportation. And as always, in a matter of whatever we have now, 40 minutes, I'm not going to be able to present all the angles to you, right? That's, ne that's always true. There's always way more than we can talk about in this short period of time. So I'm hoping that there's something here that you get curious about that you might want to dig more deeply into um, and that might feel right for you. So this is just a jumping off point, as always. So I want you to think about this. Cars are great for... So write this down in your journal there. Cars are great for three things, maybe more. And then if you have one that you want to share, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get the mics out. We have one on the balcony. Great. Thank you. Um, probably um, driving around listening to music. Yeah. I, I, I bet there are lots of people that feel that way. I agree. Yep. What else? Cars are great for... Cars are great for independence, right? We have another one on the balcony. Excellent. Thank you. 
they're great for getting to point A to point B quickly. Yes, right, thank you. Point A to point B quickly. And I hear mumblings of lots of other ones out there. So thinking about the, the idea that cars are great, 91.7% of households in the United States had access to a car in 2021. 91.7% of households had access to a car. That means 8.3% of households did not have access to a car. So it's really interesting to me that we lived for thousands of years without them and now it seems that we, you know, that's almost, that's a really high percent. It almost seems as though we must have them. That's interesting, right? It's been an evolution of culture. So how is it that, you know, this is by Psi 3, so how is it that we can question those assumptions? Can you even imagine a life without a car? So remember back to that video that Joel showed in class um, for the shelter class, suburbia. <clears throat> The idea that General Motors was the one that put out this idea of live in the country and drive to work in the city and then go back to your home in the country. So choices, connecting our housing, our shelter with our transportation choices. The idea that General Motors was the one that sponsored that video, you know, they wanted us to buy cars and it worked. It worked, 91, almost 92% of households have them. It's an evolution, it's space for each house. But really, what do we need, right? So the most ecological harmful form of land settlement ever invented. Can you talk to your neighbors about this? Why, why would William Kunstler say this? The most ecological harmful form of land settlement, why? this is most harmful or disagree you could disagree with the statement too why do you agree or disagree with this statement what makes it most harmful We have one on the balcony. Great. Hello. Hi, I'm Joel. up here. Um, so our group was talking about all of the trees that you have to cut down and mm -hmm. also the amount of cars that it would take for you to then get to your job from those suburban houses. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's good. We have one over here. Okay. 
I was thinking about like more like social health. Like there's not really community, Ooh. like real community in suburbia. Like I grew up in, like I'm from San Diego. So like the suburbia I'm used to is still very much like a mini city. Like I am close to grocery stores and I am close to, mm-hmm. you know, more industry. But like looking at this, like where there's no fences and whatever, like that looks like it would build community, but it really doesn't because everyone's like kind of living in their own world. There's no community garden. There's no public transport, like that. And another thing I was thinking about too is how like a lot of my most of our country like isn't pedestrian friendly. Like I was, I studied abroad this summer in, in the Netherlands, and like all of the signs and all of the buildings are relative to human size, not car size. So when you mm. walk around, you feel it just feels like better and safer. Whereas like you know, if I'm walking in on the side of the road in San Diego, I feel like I'm gonna get hit by a car because it's not safe for me. So. I was thinking about, I was talking about like the social health and like being able to be a pedestrian, like that doesn't really Mm -hmm. exist in a lot of places. Yeah, there aren't any sidewalks at these houses, right? Yes, and it really, I mean, it depends, you know, on how how the culture of your suburbia is, right? There may or may not be that community or connection. Um, Yes, there's There's one over here. Thank you for your thoughts, social health, interesting. Uh, yeah, so the way I saw this is like suburbs take up a lot of space. Mm-hmm. So like cities, there's like city and then like surrounded by like a lot of area for wildlife. Yeah. Uh, the suburbs take up like way more space. So there's not much room for the wildlife. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Yep. I'm just thinking about the alternative of suburbia, mm-hmm. which when I lived in South Korea for my entire teenage years, nobody lived in the suburban. We all lived in the city, which is like a neighborhood of 20 buildings that each have 50 floors. Like my home was on the my home was on the 22nd floor in South Korea, and that's only the middle of the building. I don't know. I just don't see how is that better for the environment, you know? Right. There, there are advantages and disadvantages both ways, right? So, um, so that's a really important point. That the alternative is that there you have, you know, the land that that building took up was much smaller than the land that these took up. Um, but who knows what the community was like there and, and how people share ideas in that kind of space. So thank you for saying that. Hi. So um, I was just thinking about like all the resources it takes to build all these houses because like I'm assuming that's like a small portion of a neighborhood and it's like what like 30 houses right there. Mm-hmm. And it also takes like... And then it's like, if you have a bunch of houses, then you have to put in like electricity and water towers and roads. So it's like, it takes up so much resources right. to do all this. So when you compare that to that, whatever 50 story building, um, there's definitely this, the amount per household, so to speak, or apartment is taking up more resources this way for sure. So all kinds of different angles to look at these sort of situations, right? Um, Suburbia, today we're going to talk about that idea of transportation. Whether there's mass transportation from this suburbia, I don't know. Um, But when we think about traveling to and from, whether public transportation fits into the proper schedule that you're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about public transport in a little bit. But thinking about how cars work, one gallon of gas yields 20 pounds of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So an average of 10 tons of greenhouse gases per car per year. So how does this math work? It seems impossible that a gallon of gasoline that weighs about 6.3 pounds could produce 20 pounds of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. However, most of the weight from the CO2 doesn't come from the gasoline itself, but from the oxygen in the air. When gasoline burns, the carbon and the hydrogen molecules separate, and then the hydrogen combines with oxygen to form water, which is why you see that condensation coming from your tailpipe. But then the carbon combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and that's what's heavy. Oxygen is a heavier element, and it's this chemistry that explains how it gets heavier when you when you combust it, when you burn it inside of the engine, and then that goes into the atmosphere. So 
what is ending up happening, the overview of the US greenhouse gas emissions in 2020, it's this, we're worried about this carbon dioxide. I mean, we're worried about these things too, but the amount of carbon dioxide that is going into the atmosphere. And you can see that about more than a quarter, 27% of that is related to transportation. So we've talked a little bit about industry. Um, the electric power, this is why when, you know, when whoever in your household would say, turn off the lights when you're not using them. Because not just is it more expensive, but then also to create that electric power that's running the lights in here, the heat in here, the fans in here, that's all generating carbon dioxide that's going into our atmosphere. So the bigger picture of how this happens, um, the way that uh, the emissions, million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So the red is the is the carbon or the transportation segment, and then electricity. This is a different way of seeing um, what's what was in the slide before, and how things are changing over the course of time, uh, although not changing a whole lot. Residential, industry, agriculture all how they're creating this information, or this um, gas that goes into the atmosphere. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I found an article that states that our US Department of Defense is the sing largest single institutional emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. The US military and its manufacturers fuel for jets and ships and tanks, electricity for the bases we maintain around the world, weapons manufacturing, all the supply chains that it takes to get all those supplies to do all of those things that need to be done. And so this information is kind of just coming to the surface and is very likely unreported in graphs like that. And it's also interesting that our <coughs> Department of Defense shapes our domestic energy policy. So there's some intertwining there of, I don't exactly know how it all fits together. Um, but what I do know is when we take all of this into full cost accounting, you know, when you pull up to the pump and you see the gas prices there, it's actually the full cost accounting is where we should take into all of the, all of the different costs that get the gasoline into that big tank that's under the ground that, you know, when you put your, your gas pump into your car. So under this method, all of the property acquisition for drilling, for getting the gasoline, all of the exploration, the development costs, and that all goes into one pool. So if a well is not considered successful, then the related costs are charged to expense. It's that we're not taking into real consideration how much it takes to get that gasoline to us. We're not actually paying what the gas even costs even at the prices that we're paying now, right? When I would learn to drive, gas was 99 cents a gallon. That makes me feel really old. And my driver's ed teacher said, you know, if it ever goes over a dollar, a dollar 50, people are gonna stop driving, which is obviously not what's happening. Um, and so if we take that into consideration, what we should be paying for gas is really more like $15 a gallon. So, there are other costs to cars too. Car accidents are the leading cause of death for drivers ages 15 to 20. As a category of accidents, motor vehicle fatality, it, fatality is the leading cause of death representing 20% people ages 15 to 20. More than 38,000 people die every year in crashes in the United States. And so when we take that into accounting, uh, also, you know, we have this, the, the underlying things where we aren't getting the full truth about what resources we're using. And then we have this hidden cost of life, right, when we're out on the road. So we need to take that into account too. Also, going to the social, social fabric, I'd like you to, Ben's gonna put on this video for us. Um, and we're gonna check out what happens when, when cars are added to the mix. <laughs> 